Good afternoon and welcome to today's session, AHA, Ask Him Anything with Mr. Vishal Shah. I am Prasanna, co-host of the event today. It's a very unique webinar concept, specially designed for enterprise owners, senior IT professionals. Let me introduce today's presenter, Mr. Vishal Shah, CEO and co-founder of Sinosoft Technologies. He has over 18 years of experience and expertise in IT industry. He is known as seasoned technology stalwart, an inventor of specific patented technologies, a writer, a serial entrepreneur, an investor, and most importantly, a go-to guy for MSMEs. In today's session, you will have insights on MS licensing cost, email servicing services cost, cloud backup cost, and ask him anything. Vishal sir, can you please take it ahead from here? Thank you, Prasanna, for the introduction. Yeah, good afternoon, all. So this is our first AHA, uh, which is Ask Him Anything session in the year 2023. We used to conduct this session uh, in last year. This time, we have started this at this time of the year. So basically, what we do in this particular session is whenever you register, you are given a form to be filled up. And in that form, you can post your question or questions. And when you do so, we get that particular question beforehand, before the webinar, and we analyze that question and then structure the webinar. So this webinar is structured based on whatever questions are asked by the attendees of this particular webinar. So we have compiled all these questions and we have devised seven, eight common questions from whatever questions were submitted during the registration and we will take it up. There were few specific questions which we could not generalize. So we will take those questions later after the presentation. So this is all about uh, today's uh, webinar and we will start taking up different questions for everyone's uh, um, understanding. And before that, I request Prasanna to launch the poll just to know the profile of our audience so we can relate, relate it in our consequent slides. So as we see on the screen, 15% uh, of the attendees represent uh, an owner of the organization or custodian of the enterprise data. 69% of them are IT professionals and 15% are either in IT vendor business or system integrators. So we have a very relevant uh, segment uh, who is attending this particular webinar. And because my reputation is more about around IT, most of the times it is attended by IT professionals. So let's understand the type of the questions we have received. So basically, uh, most of these questions which were posted during the registration were about effective adoption of IT in MSMEs. So many questions pertain to return on investment, specifically hardware investment, software investment, then expenses on the services. Few other questions were about how you can make your IT deployment more effective. So it was revolving around 
feature utilization of various systems, the complexities and how they can be overcome. Element of democracy means to what extent you would like to enforce the policy and to what extent you would like to take the user in confidence before enforcing the policy. So that will pertain to effectiveness. And other genre of the questions were about notional losses, means people wanted to understand how the data can be lost and how it can result in notional losses related to business continuity maintenance, some competitive exploitation because of data theft, compliance default in any vendor empanelment interaction, and about the productivity how you can use IT to enhance the productivity or how you can stop IT being um, misused, you know, against the productivity. So these questions revolved around return on investment, effectiveness of IT deployment and notional losses. So now we will start taking up different questions. So before we start taking the questions, I would like Prasanna to launch the poll and let us understand how our audience is sharing these concerns. So as we see the results on the screen, of course, all these points are derived from your questions only. So everyone would have found these concerns relevant because they must have asked any question related to any of these points. So 73% of the attendees are concerned about return on investment in IT, effectiveness of IT systems in operational efficiencies and avoidance of notional losses due to loss, leakage, and theft of data. 9% are only concerned about, uh, about return on investment, 18% are concerned about effectiveness, and 18% are concerned about avoidance. So yes, we are going to discuss something which is going to be interesting to all of us. So now we will take the next part of it, which is the question. So the first question, we have compiled is about how to decide on cloud or on-premise deployment. This is a very, very nagging question to most of the enterprises, especially when cloud products are marketed extensively. So we come across the cloud products or cloud services, advertisements, cold calls, speeches, every time we look around on internet. And because of that, we start wondering if cloud is useful or not. And if cloud is useful, whether I should opt for cloud or not. So I will answer this question in three different parts. One, I would explain what kind of level it could be in your cloud adoption. Second, we will see the logical approach to determine whether we want to adopt the cloud or we want to continue on-premise. And then I would explain the concerns. If you are taking any decision in favor of cloud, you should be concerned about certain things and you should ensure your interest on these points. So level of cloud adoption, the very first primitive most of us would have 
is for email hosting. Most of us have our emails on cloud. Nowadays, we don't maintain on-premise email servers because of spam problems, virus problems, security problems. So we entrust the cloud service providers like Google, Microsoft, for our email hosting requirements. So that is the first or very primary level of cloud adoption. Then we might use the cloud infrastructure to take the backup of our data off the premise, to take care of hardware failure, to take care of disaster kind of situation. So that is another level of cloud adoption. In personal capacity, we already have off-premise backup, which is on our Google Drive or on our OneDrive or on our Dropbox. Now enterprises also push their data, ERP data, file data, design data on the cloud infrastructure. So that is another level of cloud adoption. The third level of cloud adoption is application hosting and SaaS services. So nowadays, many of us subscribe to certain applications like HRMS or CRM or ERP even on cloud, we don't host the application server and maintain it on premise and we go for application hosting and use the cloud. And that is third level of cloud adoption. Fourth level of cloud adoption is file and data sharing and collaboration. So that is, very advanced level of cloud adoption, which is about we always keep all our files on the cloud. Whenever we want to work, we work on those files on the cloud. We share those files on the cloud with our colleagues and we continue to use cloud at the file level. So this is the fourth level of cloud adoption. And the fifth level of the cloud adoption is full private cloud infrastructure, nothing in premise, only the computer systems of the users, and then they will access the cloud. And we, they will use emails, backup, applications, file and data sharing, everything on the cloud. And they might not even subscribe to the cloud services of Amazon, Microsoft, or Google. They might co-locate their entire infrastructure in the data center, or they might create their own data center and they create their own private cloud infrastructure. So this is an ultimate level of um, cloud adoption, which we see in many very large enterprises. They have their own cloud infrastructure. So level of cloud adoption is in terms of email hosting, off-premise backup, application hosting or SaaS, file data sharing and collaboration, and full private cloud infrastructure. Either of that could be your cloud adoption. Now, how do you determine what level of cloud adoption is good for you? And how would you determine what infrastructure you should maintain on-premise and what services you should use on cloud? So the logical approach is first find out how many locations your users are distributed across. It will tell you the name, the number of remote users. Then, check what is the percentage of users at a single location. So for example, you have a factory where let's say 30 users or 50 users sit. Then you have a few sales offices where at each office there are two, three, two, three people sit. And let's say you have such five, such five or seven kind of uh, locations. In that case, if you adopt cloud, majority of your users will be dependent on internet to access your basic systems. So it is wise to have on-premise setup for your application hosting, for file and data sharing, so that majority of the users connect to your on-premise infrastructure over local area network and few users distributed outside of your office access your data through VPN. In that case, you can very well go for email hosting on cloud and off-premise backup on the cloud. So you have to decide what level of cloud adoption you want to do. Now, I will give you another example. Let's say there is a um, company uh, which has 100 users 
and it has 10 offices and 10, 10 users at every office. In that case, it is always good to either have full private cloud infrastructure or everything on the cloud so that every user connects to the internet and access the data. Data would be centralized. You can maintain the data. You can back up the data. You can roll out the changes or updates from the cloud to all the users. So this is a logical approach. You have to find out where your users are located. Now, in case you want to evaluate a cloud service, in that case, what you should think of and what should be part of your contract. So the first and foremost is exit barrier. In case the cloud adoption does not work for you and you want to go back to your legacy system. At that time, you need to anticipate what kind of exit barrier you will come across. And if you find that exit barrier, it could be in terms of data migration from cloud to your systems or in terms of some policies the cloud service provider has when you want to exit from their services. So the exit barrier is very important. If you find the exit barrier too high, you need to negotiate and lower that exit barrier for your own interest. Another is recurring cost. So you have to compare what kind of recurring cost you will incur in terms of cloud rental and internet. When you go on the cloud, your every user will require internet to use those systems. So cloud rental as well as the internet cost is your recurring cost. You have to compare that with your on-premise setup. And on-premise setup, you can take a five-year horizon. Let's say on-premise setup costs five lakhs of rupees initially, and let's say 50,000 rupees every year. So on uh, five-year horizon, you are going to spend seven lakhs of rupees, means one lakh 40,000 rupees per year. Against that, compare your expense on the cloud rental as well as your internet cost. If it is less than one lakh 40,000 rupees, you can very well go for cloud. If it is not, then you can think about on-premise deployment. When you put all your data on the cloud, it is more vulnerable and you need to understand the data leakage possibilities and you have to make sure that your cloud service provider has provisions to prevent data leakage. Then you need to understand how is the trend of that particular cloud service provider in terms of pricing the cloud services. Many a times you get free or very cheap rates to start with and next year onwards, when you create a dependency on the cloud service provider, they might escalate the price unreasonably. So in that case, when you are actually going for cloud adoption, you need to cap the price escalation in as a negotiation point with your cloud service provider. You need to have very strong service level agreement for the data integrity. So when your data is put on the cloud, they should not misuse it. They should not access it. If they do it, then you need to have non-disclosure agreement and data integrity agreement to make sure that your data is not accessed by wrong people. And you need to understand the data localization policy of government of India. Nowadays, anything you, um, uh, you want to put on cloud, it has to be on Indian infrastructure. You cannot put your data outside of India. Um, if you put it, it is against the data localization policy of government of India. So you must ensure that whatever cloud infrastructure you are sourcing from Amazon, from Google or any third party, you have to make sure that it is located in India. So this is the answer to the first question, how to decide cloud or on-premise. You need to understand what level of cloud adoption you want to do. You need to understand how your users are distributed. And you need to understand the concerns like exit barrier, recurring cost, data leakage possibility, price escalation, data integrity, and data localization policy of government of India. So this is about the answer to the first question. I request Prasanna to run the poll related to this particular question, and then we will take up another question.
So as we see on the screen, level of adoption of cloud, uh, it shows various level of adoption of the cloud. You can see the answer on the screen and we will move to the next question. So now we'll move to the next session. What is IT standardization? This question has come up maybe because most of the IT professionals as well as enterprise owners are coming across this word IT standardization and that is very much related to compliances. Bohut sare SA enterprises hai jo vendor empanelment government mein karwate hai ya fir large enterprise mein karwate hai. When they go for a vendor empanelment, they have to comply with certain standardization. And one of the standardization is IT standardization. And we will understand what do we mean by this IT standardization. So IT standardization is the standard standardization of your IT policies, standardization of your data management, and standardization of your data protection. Standardization means there is a benchmark and you at least achieve that particular benchmark and you don't fall short of it. So when we talk about IT policy enforcement as a term or one of the subset of IT standardization, it includes application controls, means as an enterprise, you should be able to control which applications the user can access and which application user will not access. So let's say if you have an accounting team which requires tally or your ERP, Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Internet, and Outlook or Thunderbird, then on that computer, only those applications should be accessed. They should not be allowed to install any other applications. And that is kind of part of IT policy. Another IT policy could be a hierarchy of admin and users. What admin can do, users cannot do, and admin has full control on the users. That is another expectation in IT standardization. Third, email, internet, and USB policies. So email is a resource for communication. Internet is a resource for communication, research, and marketing. And USB is also a resource to either connect the digital signature, digital uh, dongles, or uh, keyboard, mouse, printers. So we need to have the policy users, what they can do. So policies related to an email about each user, what he can do on email, what he cannot do on email. Similarly on internet, what he can do on internet, what he cannot access on internet. USB policies, whether he can access policies, USB or not, whether he can access it only for the inverting the data or whether he can access it for outwarding the data. So all these policies are required to be documented and executed. And when these policies are enforced, IT standardization calls it IT policy enforcement. And it happens for every user or every group of the users. Another is about data management. So when we talk about IT standardization, the first thing in data management is data compartmentalization. So let's say you have different departments in which different users are working. You have different projects in which different teams are working. You might have some confidential data which you don't want to show uh, to all users like HR data and there are many other things you have to compartmentalize your data. So you need to make sure that your data is compartmentalized department-wise or project-wise or function-wise or role-wise, whatever it is, but there has to be data compartmentalization if you want to achieve IT standardization. Then data deduplication. You have to make sure that you have minimum duplication of your data. It uses the memory and storage so badly it affects your backup success possibilities also. So make sure that you don't have duplicate data. And one of the 
good uh, suggestion to avoid duplication is centralization of the data. When you have data centralization, most of the time data is not duplicate because users are using the data from the same source. And third is access permission. So when you have your data, you have your software, you need to define the access permissions. Means accounts guy cannot access the data of, for example, design guy or design guy cannot access data of the sales guy. So you need to make sure that there are access permissions. And that is about files, folders, and the permission, what user can do on those files and folders. So the another subset of IT standardization is data management. And the third one is data protection. When you adopt IT, you generate a lot of data and you need to have very good backup and recovery strategies so that you can make sure that if your data is deleted, you can get it back. If your data is affected by ransomware, you can restore it back. Or if your data is lost because of loss of hardware or destruction of hardware or disaster or hardware failure, you can get it back. Data protection is also in terms of VPN and remote application access. You might have users working remotely, work from home or traveling. You need to make sure that you have a policy of VPN and you have the policy of remote application access for work from home users and BYOD. BYOD means bring your own device. Sometimes you allow user to come up, come and work with his own or her laptop. And you need to make sure that you have complete control on your data and your data is protected on the personal laptop of the user also. So this is all about IT standardization. Most of the questions were related to IT policy, data management and data protection. And we derived it as IT standardization related questions. So I am explaining what do we mean by IT standardization and how you can understand it better. So before we move to the third question, uh, I would like to request Prasanna to run the poll on this particular question. Uh, Prasanna, this particular question is slightly longer, so please allow 90 seconds for everyone to answer. So you can see on the screen the poll results. You can understand what kind of level of IT standardization each individual in the attendee group is having. And that gives us a very good visibility on the state of IT standardization at various organizations represented by the attendees. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you uh, some time to look at this poll results and then we'll move to the next question. So next question is about how to increase IT managers productivity in ISME. See, this question is asked by most of the enterprise owners, you know, 
uh, they have a position of an IT manager in their organization. And many a times they feel that because of not the reasons about the capability or competence of the IT professional, sometimes this IT professional is engaged in so many unproductive activities that he cannot spare his time for productive tasks. So most of the times when the organization does not have standard IT policies, standard IT systems, IT professional is always busy in maintenance of multiple hardware, maintenance of multiple software, coordination with multiple vendors, troubleshooting overheads due to mishandling by the users, manual device hardening means you want to put the restrictions and you don't have tools to do it. So the IT manager has to do it on the user system manually. Manual backup process, this is the most time consuming thing. Backup of individual computers, users keep saving data on their individual computers and IT professionals time is wasted on taking the backup of individual computers and then backup of laptops. So all these things are very unproductive tasks and um, there can be productive tasks. An IT professional can enhance the return on investment on IT for an enterprise by making IT more usable, more simple to its users. So it could be IT professional can be engaged in a productive task of training the users on operation management software. It could be your ERP. It could be your, there could be a enhancement of ERP and customization ideas. The IT professional is technically sound person. He can talk to your ERP vendor after understanding the user's requirement and he can be the best interface between your user and your software vendor. So we, we should spare the IT professional for doing these creative things. Then exploring new technologies and IT professional's time should not be wasted in unproductive tasks he should be more productive by exploring new technologies and put them at use for the organization. And then proactive monitoring and reporting. IT managers should not do firefighting all the time. He should be equipped with the tools so that he gets all the reports beforehand and he can anticipate if there is any problem and he can take proactive actions. So it is organizations it is organization's uh, duty to provide good tools to the IT manager so that IT manager's time is not wasted in taking the manual backups or maintenance of multiple hardware, multiple software, multiple vendors. And instead, IT manager can interface between your software vendor and the user. He can give good training on your operational management software. You can explore new technology. He can be proactive because he, by using those tools, he has good reports. So yes, it is not enough to hire an IT manager. It is required to equip an IT manager with some tools so that IT manager can do his or her job better, as well as they don't waste their time on unproductive tasks and they are actually contributing to the top line and bottom line of the organization by doing productive tasks. So this is my take on the question how to increase IT managers productivity in SMEs. So I request Prasanna to run the poll please on this question.
So as we see on the screen, eighty-nine percent are uh, agree that by investing in proper tools, we can increase the productivity of the IT manager for the ultimate benefit of the organization. Now we'll take up the fourth question. How to make SME information security compliance ready? See, this is nagging every MSME owner. I'll tell you why. See, every MSME owner or MSME enterprise is either a supplier to a large enterprise or government or is an exporter. In all the three cases, whether you are an exporter, you are competing on global standards. Whether you are supplier to a large enterprise or government, you have very high competition standards. And all these organizations, it could be your overseas customers, or it could be government, or it could be large enterprise, requires you to protect against cybersecurity threats as well as insider threats. And they want their vendors or suppliers or service providers to be compliant on information security standardization. So compliance coverage, what kind of compliance is expected from the enterprise? One is they should have complete control on their IT system through IT standardization and device hardening. Means their devices should be used by the users for the purpose they are supposed to be. They should be capable of recovery of accidental or intentional deletion of the data. Every customer wants their vendor or service provider to be equipped so that by deletion, they don't lose business continuity. And if their vendor lose, loses business continuity, it will affect their supply chain also. So that is also a coverage, a very important point in compliance coverage. Then there has to be file operation audit trail with data deleter identifier. There has to be a plan B. Of course, organizations have to invest in firewall and antivirus, but in case something happens and ransomware strikes and ransomware destroys the data, organizations should be capable of recovery of the data after the ransomware attack. Organizations should be capable of recovery of the data after the disaster also. Organizations should have complete control on USB ports. They should have control on their email communication so that users cannot misuse the email system for data leakage. And they should have internet controls for productivity as well as to prevent the data leakage. So most of the times, this is a combination of external threats and insider threats. Most of these companies, government or overseas customers, share technology data with their vendors. And they don't want those technology data or vendor or, or, or business data to be leaked or lost at the vendor's end. And that is the reason nowadays, in order to get empaneled to be a supplier of a reputed organization customer, they, we have to comply with their requirements and compliance is mandatory. And that is the reason this is very important and it was reflected in your questions. Now, what do I suggest for an MSME? You know, MSMEs are, you know, small organizations. They use IT at a smaller scale, maybe 15 computers, 30 computers, 100 computers, not more than that. When they use IT at a smaller scale, and if they are supposed to comply with all these conditions, you know, it is very difficult for them. It is expensive also, it is complex also, and they require real good IT qualified resources to get all these compliances done. So I always wanted to answer this question that how you can make MSME compliance ready, you know, without much of the hard work. Then nowadays, many companies have identified such a need of the MSN that they are mandated for compliance and they need plug and play compliance. They cannot have time, resources, money, 
to design the strategy for their compliance. There is a list they should comply and it should be plug and play. And for that purpose, there are products like IT in a box product. So those IT in a box products are combination of file server, mail distribution system, firewall, endpoint control, storage, backup, antivirus, VPN server, everything. And there is single dashboard and people can configure the user. As soon as the user is created, the compliance is already done. So in case the MSME has to go through any compliance audit by their customer, they can easily and successfully get through that particular audit. So answer to plug and play or ready-made compliance, if you have to go through any empanelments, the answer is IT in a box solution. So this is my answer to the question, how to make SME information security compliance ready. So before we move to the next part, I request Prasanna to run the poll related to this question. So as we see the poll result, all the attendees believe that cybersecurity compliance is most challenging. 38% believe that IT audit by customer is difficult. Maybe others are not subject to it. And 38% are concerned about mandatory vendor empanelment compliance by government. See, I'll tell you uh, one more thing is that after, uh, after this enactment, of personal data protection law by government of India, everybody who is handling the data of citizens of India will be under the purview. They will become the custodians of the data and they have to make sure that this privacy of this data is very well maintained. So we will move to the next question. How can we Legitimately minimize hardware and software license. This is this is the question very favorite to all the people who ask me the questions. So yes, you have a potential to minimize the software and hardware licensing cost. So when you have to standardize your IT, when you have to provide for your data protection, information security, you have to essentially invest in function specific IT hardware, like domain controller for IT policy, file server for uh, file storage and permissions on the file, VPN firewall hardware for accessing the data remotely, terminal server hardware for remote desktop of your application for the remote users, and application server hardware. Whatever application you use, you have to have a hardware. On the software part, in order to standardize your IT, you are supposed to use Windows Server Domain Controller for IT policy enforcement, client access licenses, Windows Server Terminal licenses, RDP KLs, Windows Pro, MS Office, MS Outlook, and G Suite or MS365 kind of email service subscription. So normally, any organization which wants to standardize their IT, they require function specific hardware like domain controller hardware to install windows server file server nas 
storage for user-wise permission, VPN firewall hardware for protecting the data from the external threat, terminal server for remotely accessing, application server for hosting the applications, productivity software like Outlook, Office, and all that. They require it, how you can minimize it. So there are three ideas. One, if you invest in IT in a box solution, you don't have to manage multiple hardware. The IT in a box will act as a domain controller, as a file server, as a network added storage, as a VPN firewall, as a application virtualization or terminal server. Only you need is application server hardware. And that can also be done on IT in a box. Nowadays, many IT in a box solution allow hosting of tele kind of ERPOs. Another alternative to legitimately minimize the hardware and software license cost is use of WAPS Office in place of MS Outlook. Not for all the users, for majority of the users, you can save good cost. And use of Thunderbird instead of using Outlook for your email client. And third technology, which is DNS splitter technology, where without changing the domain name, you can combine the service of Google Workspace or MS365 as well as some third-party cost-effective email system. Without changing the domain name, you can have some users using their emails on Google and Microsoft and rest of the users who can use the emails on some third-party cost-effective email service. So the average cost of email service will be very well reduced. I'll tell you how. Let's say you have 50 users, out of which 10 users you give Google Access, Google Workspace, or MS365 kind of subscription, and rest of the 40 users, you give them some third-party service. DNS split technology now, now can enable the enterprise to use this strategy without changing the domain name. Otherwise, for few users, we had to maintain different domain name for Google or Microsoft services. And for rest of the users, we had to maintain another domain for uh, their email service, or else we had to pay for all users the subscription charges of Google and Microsoft, which is very expensive. So by using these three ideas, you can very well minimize the cost of your hardware and software. So we'll move to the last question. Um, before that, I request Prasanna to run the poll, please. So as we see on the screen, all of the attendees would like to explore this cost-saving uh, possibilities. So I request all of you to get in touch with Prasanna with your specific questions. I'll be glad to help you save the cost. Now we'll move to the last part. What is IT in a box solution? Again, just like IT standardization, uh, we come across this term IT in a box many times. And most of the or most of the users or most of the attendees have asked these questions in their registration form. So IT in a box solution is basically a disruptive solution compared to traditional solutions. So when you want to standardize the IT as we discussed, traditionally we have to have a domain controller hardware, domain controller software, like Microsoft Windows Server. Then you have storage or file server hardware and storage and file server software like file sharing, collaboration, cloud drive. Then you need VPN firewall hardware and software. You need endpoint control for data leakage prevention. You need main vig mail vigilance and distribution software for controlling your email communication and compliance. You need backup software and hardware 
you need remote application access software and hardware. Traditionally, you require all these things. Now, IT in a box solution works very well at a small scale usage. I mean, those who have more than 10 computers and less than 500 users or 500 computers, they can very well try IT in a box solution. Now, IT in a box solution is designed on rule of 80-20. 80-20 rule means 80% of the enterprises are satisfied 100% with 20% of the features. So when you cut down your features to 20%, without compromising on the effectiveness because you are using it at a smaller scale. So you might not require certain features which are designed for large scale usage. By cutting down on these features without compromising on the effectiveness, we can very well reduce the cost of hardware. Then with smaller number of features, we don't require multiple hardware to run those features. So IT in a box is a single hardware on which all these domain controllers, storage, VPN, endpoint, firewall, email vigilance, backup, everything happens on a single hardware. So you save very good cost on hardware. And because the software installed on that is not from multiple vendors, you can very well save the cost of that. So it is it works on rule of 80-20. It is very cost effective and it is very simple. So this is my answer to the question about what is IT in a box solution. So if you are an, an MSME, you want to standardize your IT, you want to have plug and play compliance, you can very well look at IT in a box solution instead of going for this entire, this entire uh, number of so many hardware basically. So this is you can consider very seriously IT in a box is a product which is designed after understanding the requirement of MSME after their compulsions to go for compliance and successfully do it because ultimately they are subjected to it whether they like it or whether they don't like it. So this is about the last question for today. Uh, I request Prasanna to launch the poll please. So meanwhile, you are answering the uh, questions, um, sorry, answering the poll. I will take the questions which we could not cover in this particular presentation, which were slightly off uh, the subject. So, uh, Jeel Gandhi of Vardhman Computers Service Provide. Uh, I mean, Jill Gandhi's question is they wanted to know about black box. So I request Prasanna to help Jill Gandhi uh, with the demonstration link of the black box and they can know more about black box. Yes, sir. Just to summarize on Jill Gandhi's question, black box is basically uh, designed for MSMEs and uh, uh, you can use it for data security. Yeah, so we are having the poll results. 67% knew about the IT in a box solution and 33% learned about it today. So coming back to the questions which we could not cover in this demo, in this particular webinar was about black box. So we have different uh, webinar for black box. So Jill Gandhi can very well attend that. Udit Jain from Namonkar Industries as a question in, the, I mean, it is written that he would like to ask the question in the session. So uh, Mr. Udit Jain can raise his hand. We will unmute you and you can ask the question. By the time I will move to the third question from Mr. Dinesh Panchal, because it is an AHA session, ask him anything session. You can ask any question. It could be IT, it could not be. So Mr. Dinesh Panchal says that we make very good machines exported to USA and we have big market but need sales and service support in US. How to find such party? 
So, uh, Mr. Panchal, your question is not related to IT, but yes, uh, by my experience, I can answer this question. You should be having very good digital marketing strategy. And uh, by having digital marketing strategy, you can create a brand in USA market. And if you are a brand, there would be many people who want to associate with you and outsource the service part from you and uh, you can very well um, appoint these associates as your service providers and in case you want to know more about digital marketing you can attend any of the webinar we conduct on united smes where we give very comprehensive details of digital marketing mr rohit vishwakarma has uh, asked the question which is related to black box so I request Mr. Rohit to join the demo of the black box or you can connect with anybody you know in the engineering department of black box. Uh, I can understand that you are the black box customer. So you can ask the question. Mr. Bhavesh Ajmera, data peripherals, has asked the question about cloud backup. So uh, I will just uh, brief you about it. There are various types of cloud backup. Uh, one is per user per year kind of subscription. Another is per enterprise per year subscription. So when you are talking about cloud backup uh, for the enterprise level, you can always look at per enterprise per year kind of subscription for the cloud backup because it pools the storage. Unlike Microsoft, which gives one TB for every user, and uh, that particular user does not use that one TB. We can't use that one TB for other user. When you have enterprise, enterprise per enterprise per year kind of arrangement with your cloud service provider, entire space you take is pulled and every user can share that particular space. So um, that is my uh, opinion about the cloud backup. Uh, in case you want to know about cloud backup more, you can connect with Prasanna, she will help you. Then we have Mr. Lakshmi Lal Suthar uh, who wanted to know about details for IT general control on risk management, firewall database. Uh, Mr. Suthar, I hope uh, I could cover all the things in my presentation. Uh, Mr. Rohan Disoza asked about how to secure ransomware and data leaks. So for data leaks, you can go for good DLP solutions. And for protection from ransomware, you can take firewall and antivirus. And as a plan B, you know, if you are affected by the ransomware, uh, you can go for primary and hidden chamber technology, uh, which is also part of our product black box. And uh, it is a very, very effective technology to recover the data after uh, ransomware attacks and all the data is gone. Mr. Pratik Sharma has asked, uh, you know, um, how black box is better than other cloud DLP solutions. So basically this is an ask him anything session, but I do not want to talk about black box because it will not be interesting to everyone. So I request Mr. Sharma to uh, connect with the black box team and uh, you know, uh, basically they can uh, arrange a demo for him and he can very well check that demo. So this is all about for today's session. In case you have any uh, question, uh, you know, we can answer that question right now. Also, you can just raise your hand and we will unmute you. Mr. Rohan D'Souza, how to connect with uh, Blackbox team? Prasanna, please uh, help Mr. D'Souza offline. Yes, sir. Yeah, any other questions? So I think we are three minutes over short. Okay, Mr. Rajesh is asking how DLP help to prevent data. So DLP, um, we use interchangeably for data loss prevention and data leakage prevention. So data loss happens because of deletion, infection of ransomware or disaster or hardware failure. And uh, the DLP, which is data loss prevention uh, kind of solutions, they take the backup, they have uh, primary chamber and hidden chamber technology, they have off-premise backup solution, they have high availability solutions. So data DLP on that part is about maintaining business uh, continuity by preventing the data loss. Another the type of DLP is data leakage prevention. So mostly your data can be leaked over USB or internet and over internet, um, internet and email. 
So uh, you can have endpoint controls for uh, your USB uh, management. You can have uh, good sniffing tools for your email communication, data leakage prevention. And you can also have, uh, uh, you know, good policies about your internet inside firewall network, outside firewall network. And you can make sure that uh, data is not leaked by the user. And uh, one of the uh, technology which we launched, uh, patented technology which we launched was Magic Browser, where uh, that browser allows the user to download the data, but does not allow the user to upload the data. So that is, so there are, it's a very vast subject. And uh, in future, whenever we have any webinar on DLP, we will definitely inform you. If you have any specific question, you can really, you know, you can make sure that we'll answer that uh, in case you send us the email. So thank you very much. Uh, Prasanna, I would like to request you to conclude the session. And in case you have any other questions, please connect with Prasanna. I'll be uh, available myself. Thank you, sir, welcome, for Michelle. such a knowledgeable and insightful session. Thank you, everyone, for attending the session. We appreciate you being here. I hope you have learned and enjoyed the presentation. Kindly fill the survey form, which you will get at the end of the session, to give us your valuable feedback. On behalf of Sinasoft team, I thank you again for joining us today. Thank you all. Thank you.